My name is Ariel Posen. I'm a singer-songwriter and guitar player. Before becoming an artist, I spent the majority of my career being a guitar player for artists, for bands, in the studio, and on the road. Once I began my own solo career, I realized that I was shaped by my experience and that there were some interesting stories to tell. I wanted to ask a few colleagues and friends of mine who have had a somewhat similar but different road about their story and their experiences. I think there's a bigger story to tell here, and I think this is something that can be really helpful to a lot of musicians and artists on a similar path. So without further ado, on today's episode we have Afi Yervanen, also known as Bahamas. So what initially drew you into becoming a performing musician? Like what inspired you? Um, well, I guess it wasn't, I, I don't know that it performing was necessarily the first thing for me that definitely like I, the creative part of it, just the idea that you could make something up. Um, that was like a light bulb going off, right? Just, I mean, we've all kind of been there where you, nothing's happening and then you realize, holy, I'm making something or I'm writing a song or, you know, a lyric comes together and you realize, wow, that might be a full song. And I kind of had that fairly young. Um, and, and so that was kind of the first thing. And then, you know, quickly you kind of realize like, oh, like you can play in front of people and it's, it's, it's exhilarating in a similar, but different way. Right. When you're performing in front of someone, it's just, it's, the exact opposite of just playing by yourself in your room. It's like, <clears throat> I think at, at, at the start, you're, you're overthinking, you're self-conscious, you're all the things that you don't want to be as you kind of get deeper into it. Um, but yeah, I think uh, just the thrill, just the thrill, just the excitement. There's nothing like it. There's still nothing like it. Um, Getting in, getting in front of a crowd. Even this weekend, I was ice fishing at a cabin with some guys, and there was like an old guitar there that's probably been at that camp for like 20 years. And, you know, I probably need a tetanus shot at this point, but I managed <laughs> to like get it into some form of tuning. It was pretty damn low, and the action was like that high. But it was so exciting for me, and everyone else loved it, right? Because the guitar hadn't been played forever, and there wasn't a whole lot else to do. And, um, so I was just trying to bang out some songs for these guys and man, I haven't played, I played live for anyone in a year, you know? Yeah. So I was kind of nervous and, and the type of nervousness that I enjoy, you know, which is actually just like excitement that's sort of bubbling up and, and feels uh, kind of strange and wonderful. But anyway, that's sort of a long winded answer to just say like, um, realizing that performing gives you this thrill, I think, um, it just, that's the thing that got me into it. And, and in a lot of ways, it's kind of the thing that I still enjoy, you know, um, it's just, it's just pure. It's simple. It's not, there's no, it's like a relationship that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> it isn't complicated, you know, and the nights when it doesn't necessarily come together. I'm, um, you know, I think maybe when I was younger, I might have blamed it on my, my monitors aren't right or, or, or the crowd wasn't very good tonight, whatever that means, you know? But it's more just, it's always here, you know, if you're, if you're able to kind of like get yourself into that place and, um, and as cliche as it sounds, sort of live in the moment, it sort of makes for a much more interesting performance. And for me, that's often like a conversation, you know, where you're, you're actually, there's some interaction of some kind and it's not necessarily like, you know, repeat after me type interaction. It's more just like, are you doing the exact same show every night? you know, no matter what, or are you somewhat reacting to the space, the sound, the, the way your the musicians around you are playing. And I like to think that that is kind of like, for me, a much more exciting place to kind of be musically, you know? So yeah, performing kind of gives you that whole world and who wouldn't want to live in that world, you know? For sure. I want to know more so specifically of when you had a little bit of a shift in career direction, so to speak. Obviously, you were playing music, um, a lot of sideman work, playing bands, and then you made yeah. that transition. Yes. Well, I'll go. I guess I'll go back a little bit further, if 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 you'll indulge me. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I had a band. I mean, I always had bands in high school and stuff like that. And, and, and a lot of those early bands, um, you know, we, we were like the band that opened for other bands. And there was one club in the town that had like touring acts that would want to play Toronto on like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So they would play those secondary markets, you know, on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just sort of killing time to be, to be ready to play in the bigger market of Toronto. And so Barry kind of strangely got a lot of cool bands, bands that I liked, bands like Sloan and Thrush Hermit and Super Friends and a lot of like indie rock stuff that, that uh, when I was in high school, you know, meant a lot to me. And of course now having done it for a long time, just realizing like a lot of those guys are two years older than I am. And at the time I thought they were 10 years older or 20 years older. Like it didn't, it, it didn't connect with me immediately that, wow, these guys are just my peers. They're just in a band that's, they're in a better band. <laughs> they're writing better songs, you know? Um, so anyway, we, we had this band and we, we, anytime, you know, we would see that a band was coming through town, I would just call them up and say, Hey, you know, can we, is there any chance we could get on the bill? And, and, uh, a lot of the, you know, at that level, you're not necessarily always touring with support. So they're, you know, we got a chance to open for a lot of these bands and, and meet people and, and, um, have those sort of formative experiences and people that I still talk to now, you know, but, but, um, I don't know that, that like seeing, seeing those guys work and, uh, seeing them being on tour and sort of starting to get a glimpse of the reality of what that really was rather than just speculating and, uh, without any real reference point, you know, that was pretty helpful when I was very young, you know, but, um, after that, I sort of played in another band, which, which again was a, which was a which we were a good band, like good musicians. But I I can say now that the songwriting necessary it wasn't necessarily, um, it wasn't competitive in the marketplace at that time. You know, it's like we had some good ideas, we had great musicianship, but the songwriting just wasn't at the level where it needed to be. And so again, we found ourselves like opening for bands and being in proximity to really great talent, you know, and, and bands that were having a lot more success. And it's sort of frustrating because at that time I wasn't mature enough to really understand that actually it was the songs that were the problem. Everyone liked hanging out with us. Everyone loved having us on tour and would ask us to open their shows, but it never felt like the industry or the business was ready. Like I had guys literally say to me like, yeah, like, you know, if you ever like make a solo album, give me a call and maybe we could do something like it just, the band format for me just didn't work or whatever. Hmm. Anyway, um, so I had a I had like a part time job that I would do when we weren't on tour, we weren't playing, and um, and we didn't tour a, a, a whole lot, but my expenses were pretty small back then. So I'd work a little, play music, you know, the the balance of like um, of that thing in the early days. But I had this friend Tyler Clark Burke who started this record label called Three Gut. And it was the Constantines and and uh, Jim Guthrie and Guff the Duke, just really cool bands, like you know, really talented guys. And and uh, and so I kind of shared with her this frustration. I was like, I'm not sure what I'm doing, you know. Like, I want to play music, but I don't know that my songs are really the vehicle that's gonna kind of allow me to go on tour a lot and really do what I want to do, you know. And she said, well, why don't you play guitar for someone else? Like, you're, you're a good guitar player. And it was just, it was that easy. Like I said, well, I don't even know how to do that. How, how, you know, she's like, well, I know lots of musicians. Like, there's always, there's always someone who's looking for a guitar player. And it was like the next day, the, this guy Howie Beck called me, who's a producer and a mixer now. Um, but at that time, he had his own career and he'd made an album and needed a guitar player. I, you know, he got my name from Tyler. I went over there. I don't even know if we played guitar. We kind of had coffee and just hung out and cracked jokes and hit it off. And so I played in his band. And uh, there was a lead guitar player, this guy Dean Giriard, who's an incredible musician. He's much more um, skilled with using pedals and, and really crafting like a sonic kind of world to live in. Whereas I was much more like I had a tuner and was more like the, you know, rock and roll kind of meat and potatoes guy. And it was a fun, we, we did, we probably did a half a dozen gigs. We opened for Sarah Harmer and 
we went to New York City and I had all these really incredible experiences doing that. And it sort of set the, it set the, you know, thing off in my mind where I realized, man, I, doing this isn't taking away anything from my own songs. It's actually, this is a whole other avenue that I just never even thought of, you know? Um, and so, yeah, pretty quickly I started, after I played with Howie, I played with this guy, Jay Collette. Um, and at that time he was in broken social scene and they were kind of at the height of their thing and they were, they were traveling a lot and he was super busy. He, he literally didn't have time to, uh, you know, get a band and rehearse them and everything. And I, so I just sort of proposed to him, like, listen, like I have this band and we're pretty good. And I think we would be a good backing band for you. And he, he kind of like, it was a pretty cocky move. I realized now at the time to, to suggest that, but he kind of went for it. And he said, okay, I'm going to Japan with Broken. And why don't you like get the band together? And then when I come back, we'll have a rehearsal. And then I have a show opening for Lucinda Williams. And we'll go out and do that. And that'll be our first show. So it was like perfect. It was like pressure, but excitement. And, and, and it was just sort of like such good motivation for me to, to do that. So I rehearsed the band. I had the acoustic guitar and I pretended to be Jay. And I would sing and work up the tunes. And it just exactly like we planned it, he flew home from Tokyo and came to the rehearsal and was like, holy crow, you guys are like, he had never had a band that was actually prepared. You know, it was just always pick up band, like just whoever's around, they kind of know your album, they loosely play it sort of thing. Whereas we like learn the tunes and, and uh, it was really strong. So anyway, I did that for years and um, we toured all around the world, like you know, went to Japan and went to Europe many times and all around America opening up for cool bands. And, um, and that whole time kind of, I was playing on other people's albums just through that process. You know, people would see, see us play and say, Oh, that guy's pretty good. Probably, probably the same as your story. You know, it just, people are like, Oh, we should get him to play guitar on our thing, you know? So yeah, I got to play on cool records or records that I think are cool, you know, Hayden albums and, and this band called the stills that we toured with. They were like more of a rock yeah, group yeah, yeah. and, um, and lots of cool stuff, you know, just whether it was a song or actually being part of a band that was making a full album or stuff. Like there was a period there where I kind of felt like, um, you know, I had something to offer as a guitar player. <laughs> and so when the phone would ring, I'd try and say yes, you know, but so then we op we did a tour opening for Feist, and over the course of the tour, you know, she she asked me to sit in for one song, and then it was two songs and three songs, and by the end of the tour, I was just kind of like sitting in for the whole set, and um, and then there was sort of a period where I was I was uh, you know playing in her band, playing in Jay Collette's band, and I had my own band, and we sort of had this album that we had recorded that was we were jokingly calling Chinese democracy because it just kept on getting pushed to the back burner because I was busy doing all this other stuff you know and um again like I was so young I didn't I didn't have the maturity at the time to just say like listen Jay I'm really busy and Feist is kind of dangling this carrot of actually joining her band I got it you got to take it you know and I didn't, I wasn't able to just come out and say that. And to his credit, he, he kind of just like almost confronted me and just said like, dude, you got to decide, like, you can't, you're kind of holding everyone back because you're not committing to any one thing, you know, you can't do everything. And, um, you know, so it was like, it's kind of hard to have that handed to you, uh, from someone that you respect and just realize, fuck, why didn't I just man up and say that, you know, but Anyway, I'm grateful for that lesson and that experience. And of course, him and I have been buds and we've gone on to make lots of music together since then. But um, anyway, so then I joined her band and um, and we we toured, I mean, everywhere, you know, it was kind of right at the height of, of uh, her sort of commercial success. And we played on, uh, you know, the Grammys and Saturday Night Live and, and, and every, you know, everything in between, like huge places and had really amazing experiences, you know? And the best part was that the music was amazing. Like the, you know, her songwriting and the guitar playing, like just the quality of the, the caliber of the musicians and the, the caliber of the music that I was involved with stepped up really dramatically. And I was so proud to be a part of that, to be this little cog in the wheel of that thing. Um, 
ironically, I played more piano in that band than I did guitar, but, Interesting. but, um, um, that's just what was kind of called for at the time, you know? So anyway, that, you know, whirlwind tour of that album cycle sort of came to an end and I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about what I was going to do afterwards. And, you know, she moved on, started working on other projects, uh, other music. And I wasn't really a part of that, you know, and I, and I, I don't know if taking it personally is the right word, but definitely there was a period where I realized that I guess I had, I had done the thing you're not supposed to do, which is assume that, oh, I'm a part of this thing. And so you come to this place where you realize, oh no, like, yeah, I'm a part of the band. And when we go on tour, I'm in the band and, you know, I get to go in the dressing room and, and eat the avocados with everybody else, but it's not my thing, you know? Totally. And it's kind of a, it's a, it can be a difficult uh, thing to go through, you know? So anyway, after that period ended, um, and she moved on and worked with different musicians, different bands, I kind of, I, I played a couple gigs with other bands, but yeah, at the, at the risk of like just sounding uh, arrogant or something, like I just, I thought to myself, like, man, this is the best band like that I can be in. Like what gig am I going to, and like, unless Neil Young calls and wants me to like be in crazy horse, like what gig am I going to take now? You know? Um, Cause we, you know, we were, I was making good money and we were busy and it was a cool people and cool music. And I just thought that's rare. That doesn't always happen. You know, it's like, Sometimes you might get two out of the three. You might get good money and good people, but then it's bad music. Or you might get good music and good people, but bad money. Yep. I always kind of think you need to have two out of the three to say yes to the gig. But very rarely do you get all three. Sometimes you do. But um, but you always got to have two. If you only have one, then it's hard to say yes to the gig. But anyway, yeah. so that's kind of when the light went off to me. I said, you know, this is the time. Because I've got all this sort of momentum and energy from, from doing all this stuff for several years and for lack of a better term, let's call them connections, but really they're just friendships and relationships and emails and little scraps of paper that you've kind of held on to someone you open for and in, in Germany, you're just like, that's a cool person. I'll just stay in touch with them. And, um, anyway, so I, so yeah, I, I took a lot of these songs that I had worked on and, and um, recorded them with Robbie, who's my manager and my record producer and kind of my all-around guru guy. Um, he had all the equipment, the the um, microphones and all that. And actually Feist very generously just like allowed us to record in her house. My first two albums were recorded in her country house. We just drove up there and set up the gear and recorded in like two days or something, you know, super quick. And... Um, so I, you know, classic, like I made the first record for no money, like a couple hundred bucks. And then just sort of started calling people, you know, and just said, called Sarah Harmer and said, Hey, like, you know, remember we toured together, played some shows. Like I have my own album, it's called Bahamas. And, you know, I don't really have a whole lot going on, but if there was ever a chance to open for you in any way, I'd love to do it, you know, and basically just sort of did that same thing with, with, uh, Sam Roberts and and whoever else I kind of had in my uh, non-existent Rolodex. Yeah. And 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 most people said yes, you know. Most people were like, right on, send me the album. Like, probably the same thing you and I would do, right? It's just someone says, hey, can I send this to you? Yeah, sure, send it to me. I'm not going to, like, blow smoke at you if I, if, if, or if it, is, if it doesn't fit or if I'm, if I have someone else coming out on tour, but, you know, you never know kind of thing, so... Anyway, that, that was sort of the, uh, that's a long winded answer. I'm not sure if it really kind of got to the point there, but. Oh, it did. You actually, yeah, you actually answered a couple of my next questions, okay. which is okay, but we can okay. kind of elaborate. I wanted to say a couple quick things that I find really interesting. So when you were saying, rewinding to like, uh, Jason Collette, you were saying, right? Yeah. When you yeah. said Jay, first of all, were you playing with him like around 2005? Yes. Cause yeah. I remember Definitely. I was playing for this young artist and we were we were doing like this residency in Winnipeg for showcases so she could practice. 
And right. the biggest gig she did was opening for Jay at the pyramid okay. in Winnipeg. Right. Into the, well, would you have been on that? We, yeah, probably. I feel okay. like there was someone at that gig who was kind of famous. And I don't know why they were in Winnipeg, but we ended up having drinks at the pyramid afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have played the pyramid and and played with Jay like right through that whole period. So okay, that was just out of curiosity. But you were saying, yeah. you know, it's kind of cocky to think, but like I suggested a band, like for all the people who are still, you know, in that phase of their musicianship and their career of like being a, a hired gun an artist. Yeah, you have to hustle. You have to do that. No one's gonna yeah. make those decisions for you. Like you wouldn't have gotten any of those gigs had you not, you know, made the move yeah. yourself. And, and like people need to know that I always try to preach that like it's so important to put yourself forward and not mm -hmm. be afraid to speak for yourself in that kind of way. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as long really as you can, as long as you can do it in, with, uh, if you're just, you know, if you're just honest and you have integrity about what you want, don't like literally. Whatever the it says to do in terms of like networking and schmoozing, do the opposite. Just walk right up to the person, introduce yourself, say what you want, and when you're done saying it, stop saying it. Yeah. Don't go on and on and on and on and on. You know? Totally. And and yeah, so that was a a good lesson learned then and and I'm not sure I like think about it actively, but I still sort of like behave in most things in life that way. You know what I mean? It's just it's ironic because you think it's you can work it up to be all these different things in your mind and then somehow just like saying what you want, asking for what you want. Um, I, I hope more people are, are lucky enough to kind of have that skill and the confidence to kind of just do it, you know? Yeah. 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 Another interesting thing you said, which resonates with me greatly and would resonate with a lot of other people specifically who have gigs. They're not, the, mm -hmm. it's not their gigs, but mm -hmm. it's the gigs they play for. And I feel like people that, uh, take the sideman thing so seriously you feel an ownership over your gig yeah even though it's not yours you're, you're replaceable yeah. at any time you know really yeah yep. yeah you get you're saying you get to be in the dressing room you get to travel on the tour bus yeah you're mentioned on stage you're featured on stage you feel like you're an important piece of that puzzle which yeah you are in the live sense and maybe yeah. on the recording side too but at the end of the day uh you can be a side man, you can be kind of like more of a glorified role, but it's, it's, yeah. it's easy to blur those lines and sometimes realize, Oh, wait a minute. I feel like, or I, I thought I was, uh, way more a part of this than I really am. Yeah. And yeah. it takes well, those kind of moments. Because audiences will project what they think onto you, right? They'll think yeah. exactly, you know, they'll think that you're something else too. Right. And, and, it, and, uh, I'm proud to say I don't spend too much time Googling myself, but I do know that, 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 uh, if you get into that thing where you're, where you're, you know, checking every comment and, and you start to believe the hype, right? You start to totally. think, wait a second, I am in the band, <laughs> Totally. you know, no, it yeah. doesn't say, it doesn't say Afy and Feist on the poster, you know, but, um, but yeah, that's a, and I've had to learn that now as a band leader, right? I've gone through the exact same growing pains with the musicians that I play with now. Um, because uh, exact same, I like to work with different people. I, you know, I like to go to different places, work with different musicians, different studios, and you go to go through these growing pains. And the, the only time it's been awkward is when I didn't take that full responsibility and just pick up the phone and said, Hey, I'm going to go make a record with you know, Pino and James, and this is just what I want to do. These, these guys are available. We're going to go record with them for three days. It's going to be awesome. Like yeah. got some really good tunes and it'll be awesome. When we go on tour and, and play them, you know, communication. It's the most yeah. important. And, and it's the thing you take for granted. And if you put it off because yeah, it's an awkward conversation or whatever, but the times when I've kind of just been forthright and just say, why is this? It's not, you know what I mean? It's not some secret. It shouldn't be a secret. It's like, this is the way I like to work. And, uh, and I'm so grateful to have all these other people involved. And at the same time, anytime they're doing their own projects, solo projects or playing with other artists, I'm just like fanning the flames. I'm like, go for it, do your thing. Because yeah. playing with me, you know, you'll get, you'll make a little bit of money. You'll get to travel around. I think the music's good. 
I think the caliber of the musicians in general they like to hang out with is really good. And you, whatever prestige you get from playing with me, you'll have all that, but you'll never, it'll never be your thing, you know? Yeah. It's such a delicate thing. And I, yeah, I, I respect that you have such a just realistic mindset about it. You've, you've been on yeah. both sides. So you, you know that like, uh, you can give the, the best or like the most respect you can to them but you also have to respect their best interests and and you're just looking at the big picture you, so you just see how there's feelings involved and there's, yeah. there's business and there's all these things that kind of get jangled up and they shouldn't mm-hmm. it's an interesting oh, it's, thing it's it's uh but you care about it because it's worth caring about it's it's yeah. it's it means you know it's so it can be so uh exhilarating and exciting and also so frustrating and painful for the exact same reason because it's it's so meaningful right yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've, there's lots of times, even still, I, I, I take it for granted, I guess. I don't, I don't think, oh, I should, I should make sure that they know all these other things that I'm doing that they're not a part of, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but the times when you can do that is, uh, is, is, I think a better way to go, you know? So it's sort of developing that communication and it takes time you know i think it's there's no shortcut you kind of have to make some mistakes and stumble around and so you told me about making the first record i had a question about that but you answered it uh you kind of have talked about this but i i, I just wanted to know did you feel it sounded like you were pretty self-motivated to make that first record it wasn't necessarily like anyone else was urging you to 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 do that was it was it all just like internal um, I mean, a lot of it was, and then Robbie was sort of the catalyst for the thing. Like he did really encourage me and he still does. I mean, still, uh, it's, you know, it's a partnership. It, if it is a band, it's, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a, it's a band with him. The only difference is he just takes 20% of everything I make, but, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he really did encourage me in the early days to, to, to record some of these songs and, and maybe I didn't even take them as seriously. Like I, you know, I, some of my early songs maybe had more humor in them. And, and, um, and I maybe, I, I hate to say novelty songs cause I don't think of them in that way. I mean, they're love songs, but he just said like, dude, you should record those. Those are good songs. You know, that right. it wasn't any, it wasn't any more complicated than that. So he did encourage me a lot and facilitated that just with his, you know, knowledge for engineering and producing and, and just having all the, the microphones and the Neve products or whatever other things you need. The first recording was, um, there was no ambition beyond just making the recording because nobody even knew what it was yet. I, it, it was just AFI. It wasn't Bahamas. It was, it was nothing yet. It was just my songs, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, a it was a pretty, sort of easy choice to make. And then the other thing is like the guys that I had played in a band with while I was gone playing with Feist, they had formed this other band called Zeus and they, you know, had made a great record and it really like kind of caught me by surprise because I didn't know that they were doing that. I knew they were playing, but I didn't realize it was like another band that was forming. Of course it was, I was gone for years, right? They're, they're going to keep making rad shit without me. They're not going to wait for me. Um, yeah, so again, it's like kind of growing pains and, and like probably competitive a little bit, you know, not, not ever consciously, but just like, I saw them doing rad shit and I'm like, well, I want to do something rad. I'm going to make my album, you know? But I mean, of course that's me like looking back, whatever, like more than a dozen years later. So now that you've, now that you've spent like a, you know, considerable considerable time on both sides of like artist guitar player um you know do you have any grand insight into the music industry that you think would benefit others who are interested in pursuing the similar path or pursuing success of course it's so hard because it's like i don't think that i mean even though you and i can find so much common ground i can almost guarantee that our experiences bobbing and weaving here and there saying yes to this and yes to this and no to that and yes to this. It's so different. Every person that I know, every person that I've met and ever talked to, they're, 
their path and their experience through it is completely unique. There's no ladder. There's no structure. Even though there is a business and an ecosystem for developing talent, I think most of the people that I meet and work with are totally outside of that. They're not necessarily getting signed to development deals and then getting flown out to work with a producer here and, yeah. you know, crafted into something. It's like, it's, it's uh, artists who are just trying to expose themselves to so many different things in order to develop their own sense of what they like and how they want to put themselves out into the world. And, um, and I mean, maybe that, maybe that's the advice. It's just like, you have to kind of say yes to a bunch of things. You have to, yeah, you have to, you have to eat crow. You have to make some mistakes. You have, hopefully those mistakes aren't too big or public or whatever, but you have to kind of like, um, you have to experience those things and to sort of give you a sense of what, what you might like, you know? And, um, I, I, for, in my case, I'm fortunate that I, a lot of the sort of like more vanity portions of, of being a musician, I kind of got a taste of, if I wanted to satisfy that, I certainly got a taste of that by the time I was 27, you know, but playing on TV and playing, uh, you know, playing at the Grammys and there's Beyonce 10 feet away and, and, you know, in your mind, you work it up to think it, that it's something else. And then you realize, oh, they're just musicians. They're just, they're just artists. They're just people, right? Yeah, doing the same and thing. And they're, they're doing it at a very, very high level. Tons of pressure, you know, tons of people thinking, oh, you should do this. You should do that. Think about how much harder it is to stay true to what it is that you want to do when they're hanging million dollar offers in front of you for this and that and, and everything else, you know? So, um, anyway, I feel fortunate that I like in a way, I don't want to say got it out of my system, but by the time I made pink strat, like my first record, it was almost a reaction. Like I was like, ah, I kind of went there. I hung out a little bit and just thought, eh, you know, I, I, I just want to be making music. want to be in the studio. want to be hanging out with musicians. And that's the thing that I actually enjoy the most. So what, what can I do to do that more? Well, I'll just make my own record and then I'll decide when I go on tour and I'll decide who I work with and I'll decide this, this, and this, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I, I think just saying yes more than you say no is, is probably a good starting place for, for young people or people that are kind of wanting to have some sort of, uh, professional ambitions. It's just like, just say yes, because um, a lot of people wish that they got asked and never get asked, you know? So if somebody's asking you to do something, yeah, may do what you can to say yes, you know? I mean, if it's, if it's quality people, as, as I said, if you have two of the three, yeah, of course, either you got good music, good people or good money, you got to have two of the three. The one, the one thing I will say is, is, and maybe it's different if you're a side man, but if you're an artist, uh, I read this thing with Confucius, do you know, Confucius, the, the, uh, he's a Chinese, uh, philosopher. It's a, you know, a lot of people subscribe to Confucianism, but anyway, he's got a lot of these proverbs, you know, these sort of sayings that, that give you some insight into your own thinking, into your own way of life. And he says, he says only a dead fish swims with the current. He says a fish that's alive goes left, goes right goes, turns around, goes back up the stream. If he's going down the stream, he goes faster than the, than the rate of the water. And of course, like, you know, I may have just like went out on a limb and I may sound totally cheesy, but when I heard that, I was like, that's so cool. Right? Like, even if it's as simple as like, you know, when everyone else is coming into town and you see all the traffic going in this direction and I'm in the car and I'm going to the cottage at 7 a.m. on a Tuesday, I think I made the right decisions to be there. That's what works for me, mm -hmm. right? Everything else is moving in this direction and I'm going in this direction. And it's easier. There's less, there's less friction, right? If you start to get in there, you get in that traffic jam and you're competing with everyone else for a space in that, in that, on that highway. And then you're competing for everyone else for a space in that office and, and for that job or whatever. That's a, that's a different type of stress. Some people are cut out for that. Some people want that. But I think if you're an artist and if you're a writer, 
you always want to feel like you're making something that's your own. And to do that, you have to look around, whatever, don't, you know, don't have to be ignorant, but look around, see what Alan Elf is doing and say, what, what am I doing here? And where's my lane? You know, how can I create a whole a road for myself? How can I create a whole world and ecosystem for my fans to live in? Not just with my music, but with my, you know, videos and, and my concerts and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, again, I probably could have uh, put a little more effort into being eloquent on the delivery of that. But I, I do mm. like that message of just, of just uh, only, only the dead fish swims with the current, you know? I love that. That kind of leads into this question, dude. So as an artist, how much of your work would you qualify as innovative? And, you know, in, in such a closed modern market right now where so many genres and micro genres are what they are, like, how are you, like, like I said, I think I know the answer or what you're going to say. And you've kind of touched on it, but like, how, how are you trying to keep things fresh creatively? Wow. I mean that, you know, that's, that's a great question. And, and, um, I mean, like for the, to my previous answer, like you always want to feel like you're doing something unique. You always want to feel like you're doing something original that only I can do. Right. And, um, as a guitar player, I gotta say, I, I haven't felt that way in a long time, probably more than 10 years. I feel like my playing progressed, you know, exponentially in the early days, it got to a certain level where I felt really confident. And I, and I still do that I could sort of be in a room with whoever and hold my own and have something to offer. But my playing just sort of plateaued at some point as I, as soon as I got into writing songs seriously, and I started to say, wait a second, my songs are actually the thing that's earning me a living and, you know, facilitating all this other stuff. I, I immediately just spent all my time writing and working on ideas of, of, uh, how to put the music out in, into the world and all that kind of stuff. And my guitar playing just kind of feels like it's, I know it's incrementally going up just because, that's just what happens if you do push-ups every day. But my, a lot of my friends, Christine, who plays with me, like she practices guitar, as I'm, I know you do. It's like they practice guitar every day, so in some cases for hours. And they play with other artists and they play different genres and they're constantly expanding their musical mind. And there's a big part of me that's jealous because um, I feel so frustrated often as a guitar player to the point where on my last record, I, I played barely any guitar. But um, as a writer, I think if I if I get to sort of like feel like I'm pu pushing any grounds or pushing any sort of barriers or whatever, I think it's just in the lyrics. It's just in the way uh, I sing the songs, you know? I don't know that my um, chords or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of mining a lot of material that I think has been, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean... I like Neil Young. I like Bob Dylan. I like classic songwriting. I like, but the thing I love most of all of all those things is when they just get a lyric that, that you say, how, like you hear Willie Nelson sing, sing something and you think to yourself, how is it that he's singing to me? He's singing to, he must be singing to me. He knows yeah. exactly what I'm thinking. He's just reading my brain like a book and he's singing to me. It's saying, how do you do that? And I, and I don't want to say I figured it out because if I had a formula, I'd be a much more successful than I am. But <laughs> I think that what I realize is, is the more personal I can be and, and, and honest about how I feel and, you know, my experience or whatever, it's weird, this weird irony because it just, it just allows other people in, you know, it just allows them to, to have that exact experience where they sort of project themselves onto the song and the song takes on a life of its own that's completely beyond me and um and uh that's so satisfying you know that's kind of the that's the that's the most satisfying thing as a writer to think that a song might go into someone's life and and just kind of become woven into the fabric of their life you know into a moment of time or 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 just you know that that's just ma that's magic that's that's mm -hmm. uh stuff that's hard to explain and even talk about, but it's certainly the thing that you're after when you're writing a song more than writing a hit song or, or, you know, commercial success or whatever. It's to actually have a song that kind of like 
gets in there with people that touches them so deeply that they just have to have it in their lives, you know? Um, totally. I feel like I have one. I, I'd like to have 10, but, <laughs> you know, it's hard. Yeah. It's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but um, yeah, I think that. And then in terms of uh, making albums, um, this, this uh, when I was playing with Feist, I met Gonzalez, the piano player, and who he's you know writes with her a lot and produces a lot of her albums and stuff, and an incredible musician, just a, ridiculously talented. But he, he, we spoke about um, like bluegrass music, which I love, and classical music, and how there's there's virtually no production. It's really like a document um, of what's happening, and either the musicians either it comes together in that moment, and the emotional sort of weight of what you're doing is transmitted to tape or, or to, you know, Pro Tools or whatever, or it's not. And so that's when you, you know, you, those guys, those are, those bluegrass guys, man, talk about fidelity. Like Oof. if you're Tony Rice and you're recording acoustic guitar, there's the, the wood, the strings, the pick, the mic you're using. There's like, there's nothing else. There's no filter. And I kind of, I, I love that idea and I got obsessed with it. And I mean, all my recordings are kind of like that to a certain degree where it's like to the point now where I'm like, you know, not even using reverb or, or I'll go on tour and I'll, I have a pedal board that I paid good money for. And sometimes I don't even bring it. I just bring a cable and plug right into the amp and, and, and my guitar tech hates it because when I unplug the guitar, it makes a big sound or whatever, <laughs> you know, but it's like trying to connect with that part of it has been so uh, liberating and, and inspiring for me over the last 10 years is just trying to get closer and closer to that place. That's uh, it's not a live album, but in its presentation, it's a, uh, it's, it's like, you just want to have fewer barriers between the song and the person listening. Yeah. You just want the music to be right on the edge of the speaker and and there's ways to do that that can have textures and layers and, and different depths and everything. But you know what I mean? When the, when the song is just, you don't have to wonder what it is I'm singing about. You know, the vocals are front, the lyrics are clear, the music is presented like, you know, the get, everything's in its place. And everything's there just to serve the song. Nothing yeah, more. Nothing yeah, less. again. And, and, and that, that's just like, again, I totally feel that way. And it seems like, wow, how many guys have said that before us, you know? But it's so true. And yeah. you have to like, there's no shortcut. You have to kind of like go through um, the roller coaster of like having expectations and recording things and then often them not working out. Like you just, you have to be able to listen back and say, man, this is not it. This isn't the take. This isn't the version. Or, or you know what? The third verse, every time the third verse comes up, there's that one lyric that kind of bugs me. And maybe I even talk over it to whoever else is in the studio to try and like distract myself or distract them. And it's like, you have to be honest and say, that's not working, you know? And I have songs where I didn't do that and they made it out into the world, you know? And, and so since then, either I don't play them or if I do play them, I have to like rewrite the lyric or I have to, you know, I have to fix them. I have to make them better. And uh, that's a that's a weird thing. So yeah, I don't know. I think I think uh, I I don't know that I would classify it as innovation, but I certainly it's certainly the thing that's on the front of my mind is just like how to put this music out there. There's so much guitar based music, um, and I certainly love the guitar and I write with the guitar, but I I wouldn't I don't like at this point I don't think of it as as a guitar based or whatever you know what i mean mm -hmm. like i i just i think my my the, the the artists that i'm looking up to are often like hip-hop artists and and lyrically like just people who are pushing the you know culture forward and music forward and and hip-hop's amazing because they're they're able to sing about modernity in in in, in a way that's so poetic and beautiful that i don't know that singer songwriters have really figured out how to access that yet because singing about technology, like the stuff we're doing now, sing about Zoom, sing about iPhones. And like, guess what? People kind of like, they don't, you know, they have this reaction to it. Whereas in hip hop, you can do that. And it sounds mm. badass. And it sounds like, yeah, that's, that's my life, you know? Yeah. 
And so trying to crack the code on that sort of stuff a little bit is really uh, challenging and exciting. And, um, and yeah, I think that's kind of the thing that I'm interested in pursuing, you know, going forward. It's like, I'm not, I'm not a terribly nostalgic person. And so the idea of like, as much as I love Amy Winehouse or, or, um, you know, some of these other artists, I, I, I would never think to do that, like a more of a throwback record, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't say to take anything away from that record. It's an amazing album, you know, but it's like, it's just moving forward. It's all about moving forward, yeah. you know? Yeah. Love that. Do you practice, do you practice guitar like hours a day? No, I used to when I was like, uh, 18, 19, early twenties. I, yeah, I would play, I'd wake up, play end of the day, stop playing. But now I, right. my pra I don't <laughs> like my practice now is just playing. Yeah. I just kind of play. Yeah. But I found it interesting. You were saying how like you feel like you plateaued. And right. I think a big part of that is when you kind of just find, like you were saying, it's, you know, lyrics and songwriting just took over. But yeah, that's also kind of what finding your voice is all about. You don't have to yes. search as much. You want to keep evolving and like grow. But mm -hmm. there's a bit there's something to be said about finding your voice and just like, hey, I've landed on something that is me and really sounds yeah. like me and it feels the most genuine and honest in my playing. Yeah. Why yeah. do I need to ch keep running away from this and find the next thing? You can evolve on that. You can like yeah. find different aspects of it. But I, that's how I kind of took what you were saying. And yeah. um, it's, it kind of it can kind of come out like self-deprecating. But I think it's actually a good thing in a lot of ways, too. Oh, for sure. For sure. And And the other thing, too, is like, you know, I don't want to say it's easy, but the growth at the beginning is exponential, right? It's like yeah. you just explode out the gate. If you discover that you got the passion for it, it just takes off. And mm -hmm. if you have natural gift, then then even more. You got another advantage, you know. I, yeah. I never felt that I had that natural, like the way some of my other friends are just so tuned into it. I felt like I kind of had to, guy who put in more time than the other guys, like had to just work a little bit more and was happy to do it because I enjoyed it. Okay, last question. Last one. All right. Um, so now that you have the hindsight, mm -hmm. would you would you change any of your decisions along the way? Like especially the ones early on. Like what what was if you had to actually think about it? I know one wouldn't be there without the other. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's kind of, what that's was kind one, of the what short was answer fun? is that no. I mean, just because you kind of like I said earlier, you just I just feel like all the mistakes are kind of part of it, and we don't we don't maybe society doesn't value mistakes maybe in the same way, yeah. but they are so important. You have to allow people to fail, right? I mean, I'm doing the same thing with my kids, right? Like, oh, I'm too scared. I don't know how to swim. It's like, no, you don't know how to swim. And you have to kind of like feel that sense of panic that, oh my God, I'm going to go out of the water. I'm going to have water in my mouth. And then you fucking start paddling as hard as you can. And then you literally see it on their face. They go, oh, I can swim. Daddy, daddy, look at me. I'm swimming. I'm swimming. And it happens like that. And it only happens if you give them an opportunity to fail. And so, you know, I, I, you know at the risk of sounding old, I, I wonder uh, with just how much people are exposing themselves at a young age in, in terms of like, you know, social media, Instagram, putting your, putting your stuff out there, uh, failing publicly, it's a harder fall, right? It's a bigger, it's a bigger fall, right? So I think me, probably you too, like a lot of the shitty music that I was involved in, which at the time was really important to me, but it wasn't worthy of a bigger audience. It wasn't ready to go out there and compete in the marketplace of ideas in the marketplace of songs. Like I'm lucky I was, I had that opportunity to play shows, to make recordings, you know, that just, they were all just kind of like steps in the chain towards actually making something that was worthy of being heard. Um, so from that perspective, I don't think I would change anything. But, um, you know, I think I think just, yeah, maybe it's boring or something. But I, I think just that whole thing about honesty, you know, just being honest with yourself is the most important thing. Because, like I said, that whole thing with the like, like, like a lyric that bothers you, it'll always bother you. If it bothers you when you're writing it, 
or if it bothers you when you're playing it for the rest of the band, you're like, oh, I'll just fix it later. Like, I'm just so excited because I just wrote this new tune. I really want to play this new tune. But the, that lyric in the third verse is kind of weak and you know it. It's like, don't let that slide because every time you sing it, every time it comes around, every time you hear it, it's going to bug you. It's going to nag at you because you're going to know. Even if no one else knows, you'll know that it's weak and that it could be better and that it should have been better. And so, you know, that happens, I think, naturally as a writer, which is why, I mean, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time listening to my own music anyway, but sometimes when I hear older songs, I'm like, ah, fuck, should have, you know, should have got in there and just, just worked a little bit harder to get that one word or that one line sure. that just was the right one, you know? For sure. Um, but, but, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of what it's all about, is, is, is figuring that whole thing out. Song that nobody hears is just another bad idea. 